Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see all of you again. I did miss you a little bit, even though it was so pleasant up there. <laughs> and I did apologize to Larry this morning for calling him last Sabbath at 9 o'clock, telling him it was 41 degrees in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. <laughs> I like to tease him a lot because I knew he, he would take it well. My sister-in-law, my wife's sister, called text her yesterday morning and uh, the backyard where she was staying this week not much bigger than this little area right here in the front and um, her black lab ran a moose out of her yard yesterday morning so it's a whole different world up there believe me <laughs> wonderful I think it was about three weeks ago there was a little girl that died here in Tyler her name was Naomi she died of I believe it was leukemia she was getting better doing very well. She was in a children's hospital in Dallas and they had to rush her to the ICU one afternoon and she died within about three hours. Very unexpected. I know her dad very well. He's somebody I met through a business contact and I felt very sorry for him because I know they were all shocked. They were so encouraged that, he, that she was getting better and they were very hopeful that she would recover from it. But you know there are many life-changing stories that all of us have heard over the years. Sad stories, stories that change people's lives forever. I've read a lot recently on some of the survivors of the Holocaust, some of their stories of the things that they had gone through. I think it was just this last week, it was the one year anniversary, if you can call it an anniversary, of the killings in Norway and what occurred over there. Charles spoke a couple weeks ago on what occurred up in Aurora, Colorado and the problems that um, happened up there and, and the travesty of it. And then just this last week we had problems in Wisconsin, I think it was last weekend. Um, and the, the sad statement to make is that there are going to be many more of these things as life goes on. And that is not easy to deal with. There are people who want to know why in the world these things happen. I got an email this week from a friend of mine and she was telling me of, a, of an accident that her husband had had and he was trying to recover from this accident and the question on his mind was why did God let this happen to me? <coughs> How do you explain tragedies to people? Isn't it our job to try to help them to understand? We're supposed to be a light to the world, and we're supposed to be a little more than just something people can see. We should be able to shed a little light on some of the problems that people face and why they face them and why they happen. Because these are common questions that we're going to re review here in a few minutes as to what are on people's minds. And you know as well as I do, if you're familiar with your Bible, and I know you are, that <coughs> things are going to be tough and get worse before Christ returns and before it gets better. And people really do want to know and understand because they are totally confused. We're not talking about just Christians. We're talking about people that are atheists who don't believe in God would like to know why these things happen. We're talking about agnostics who maybe there's a God, maybe there's not. I don't, I don't really know. But they want to know as well. And then there are Christians who have a fairly good understanding of the Bible but can't seem to put it together and understand why these tragedies happen and affect people's lives, Christian lives, people who believe in God, who live by God's way and yet have problems, and it changes their lives. And we're talking also of Christians who have turned their backs on God and have become angry because they don't know why things are the way they are. I know what it's like to have life-changing situations. I know how, what it feels like to be in pain and to hurt where you can't get around. But there are other people out there that want to know as well. And I hope that this morning we can go through some things that will maybe shed a little light on it and help you to explain to others of what you understand and what you have gained from God's word. People want to know why is the world the way it is? You can answer that. It may take a little study to put the scriptures together and we'll do a few scriptures today, but people want to know that. There was one theologian who asked the question, is there a God? 
Now, he's a theologian. He asked the question, is there a God? If there is, he should resign because of the state that the world is in. Where is God? People just want to know, where is he? He's been silent for almost 2,000 years. Why hasn't he done something? Why does God let so many people suffer, good people, along with the bad people? Why does God, as someone said, refuse to intervene? Good question. A good question. And yet, somebody else wanted to know, is he unable to? And he fully believes this. Another theologian, he believes that God does not have the capability to intervene and to correct things. Why does God remain silent? And why does God allow so much suffering, so much pain, and so much evil in the world that we live in today? Let's see if we can answer that. My morning starts out probably different than most of yours. I get up fairly early, a little bit before 5, and at 4.55 every morning I turn on Fox News because they have a segment called The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly in the news. I can't, I can't miss it. It's just... It's about anything and everything, but I do like to watch it, so I turn it on. So that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to talk a little bit about the good, the bad, and the ugly of life. And maybe we can understand a little bit of the why some of these things happen. And I would, I would recommend you go back uh, to a sermon Charles gave a couple weeks ago and listen to it if you haven't heard it because it was very good. It was on a book that I had just read, uh, God Forsaken by Dinesh D'Souza. <coughs> A very good book, and I've got a couple other books that I would highly recommend to you as well because these people put, put these thoughts and subjects in a perspective that maybe is a little bit different than we would have thought of it, but they've got some very good points, very good conclusions, and some thought processes that will help you understand what we are facing and what we are going through. This is how I would explain it to people who come to me and who would like to know why things happen. I spent this last weekend with my wife and, and uh, a relative, we'll say, and uh, this relative used to believe in God, used to be involved with the church and isn't anymore. And her basic thoughts right now are that she really does not know that much if God is really there or not and is, is unconcerned about it. That's kind of a sad state to be in. And her son does not believe in God whatsoever. And when you come in contact with these, these type of people and you try to help them and try to, you know, work with them a little bit, it's very difficult because a lot of it has to do with the fact of what life is all about and, and the unpleasant experiences that they have had over the years. And just, just for the simple fact of, of Christians, as we're talking about, there are a lot of Christians that don't understand the Bible enough without becoming angry and blaming God or the problems that de develop in life, especially if it's something personal. We can't do that. There was a sermon I gave a couple weeks ago, or I guess a little longer than that now, on the subject of freedom, man's freedom. God gave man the freedom to choose. And the reason that we have our problems today that we have are two words, sin and freedom. We could close the book and sit down and go about our way and forget the sermon because that's what it is. But we're going to go into it a little deeper than that. To be specific, the reason for our situation is sin and freedom, and we need to understand that, and people need to understand that. Our purpose is that God wants us to choose him freely, and when that plan was put into place and man made a mistake and chose the wrong thing, when you think of freedom... Man has the freedom to do good, but man also has to have the freedom to do evil to be totally free. And it might surprise you, but there are some people out there that um, choose to do evil. They really do. And if it's not kept in check, it just gets worse. And I think we have to understand and realize, and I'm not going to turn to it, but, but what Paul said, that we are, we are at war and at battle with a spiritual world and spirit, spiritual, world and spiritual forces which does influence a lot of things. But man ultimately is the blame for what he did. If you would, turn over to the book of Psalm, chapter 42. 
David faced this same nagging question from people around him. He says in Psalm 42 and verse 3, My tears have been my meat day and night while they continually say unto me, Where is your God? Verse 9, he says, I will say unto God my rock, Why have you forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with the sword in my bones, my enemies reproach me while they say daily unto me, Where is your God? I've had over the years a few people ask me, you know, where God is because they know the way I live, the things that I do, and that I do believe in God. And in short, I just tell them, oh, he's up there, and he's alive, and he's got a plan in mind. But you have to be able to explain that plan to people and to reinforce what you know and understand to them, at least as a means of maybe bringing up a little bit of an interest where you can work with them. Not everybody's interested in God. Not everybody's interested in changing the world. There are a lot of people that like things the way they are. But as we're going to see, there's a lot more taking place behind the scenes that God has freely given to us in his word if people would just look at it. I had about a page and a half of scriptures. I'm not going to turn to all of them. Obviously, I can't do that. I don't have enough time. But there are so many scriptures throughout God's word that explains and tells why we are in the position we're in, why we have the problems that we have, and why God doesn't answer the prayers of Christians who believe in him day in and day out. There are some good books on suffering that I would highly recommend because I, I really think that they, they also bring a little different perspective, but each one of them refers to scriptures in the Bible of, with what we're talking about. The one I already mentioned was God Forsaken, that Charles had given a sermon on a few weeks ago. It basically deals with people faulting God for allowing so much evil and suffering in the world. And he approaches it from the standpoint, uh, the, the one area I got was the intricacies of the universe and how the world was put together and the natural laws that without them, man could not exist. Life could not exist. Very, very well done. Another one is why do bad things happen to good people? by Rabbi Kushner, and it was written because his son had died, I think, in his early teenage years of a disease that causes advanced aging, and he was very, very hurt by it, but another very good book. And then the one that I'm going to refer to today a little bit was an author I met a few years ago when he came to Tyler. Um, his name was Philip Yancey. My wife was able to work out the circumstances whereby we could get him to Tyler and very helpful in that. But I just read his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, that uh, is a very, very good book. But this one is called Where Is God When It Hurts? And the whole book is about pain and suffering and people he's encountered and how difficult it is for people and the circumstances they're in to deal with pain and suffering. People who believe in God and people who don't believe in God. It's a very, very good book and I would highly recommend it. What was it that Jesus said, because this, I'm not gonna turn there, but this goes in with why we are looking at the things we are in this world today. What was it Jesus said when he was brought before Pilate and Pilate asked him if he was king of the Jews? Do you remember what he said in John 18 and verse 36? He said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. That's one of the reasons we have the problems that we have today is because this is not the kingdom of God. And there are a lot of people who, who think and will tell you that the kingdom is already here because Christ brought it. And I've, always, I've told a couple people over the years, if this is what God has brought as far as his kingdom, he needs to start over again because it isn't it. It isn't what it's supposed to be. But we need to understand that this is why we are in the situation we are in today. The kingdom is not here. It's of a dis different design and a different origin and of a different character. And it has just not reached us yet. Now we have a good example of that through God's word and what it's going to be like, but it's, believe me, it's not there. And if you know your Bible, and I know you do, you know what I'm saying. What must it have been like 
in the very beginning when Adam and Eve were created. I've wondered about this a lot, how, how the relationship between God and his creation was good. It was wonderful. If you go back and you read that in the book of Genesis, it was a pleasant place. Having contact with God day in and day out and having conversations with him, there was no sin, man was perfect. What more could man have wanted and expected? Man didn't know any different. This, this was all man knew and understood. And when God gave mankind that opportunity to live in the Garden of Eden and told him what he did and what was available, and that would have been no different if we would have been there, we would have made the same mistake and the same poor decision that they did. But what must that have been like? I think we can only speculate because we don't get that much from the Old Testament as to what was taking place. But what a phenomenal atmosphere and what a place that must have been. That would have been the kingdom of God on earth at that time for a short period of time because I don't think it lasted very long. But when you turn to chapter 3 and you read at the end of the chapter what was taking place and what had happened because of man's poor choice, life became a risk, a serious risk. Everything changed. Tar Charles touched on this a couple of weeks ago when he talked about women giving birth and, and the soil and the curse. And believe me, we know how the ground can be cursed, because it is. Verse 22, the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Apparently that was available after they had sinned. But God put that in check very quickly. The Lord God sent him from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from where he was taken. So he drove out the man and placed at the east of the Garden of Eden, Caribbean with a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Man was thrown out. Man was restricted. Man's world changed. That alone is a lot of speculation as to what it must have been like. You know, what did they feel? Sure, they felt sorry for what they had done, but did they realize when they were taken and pushed out of the garden what was going to take place? Their their whole world was turned upside down, and it got their attention. And how many times do you think, as life went on day in and day out, that they wished they would have made a different decision at creation? We can only think about it. We weren't there, but we got enough that we can understand. Most of our problems, most of the problems that we face are from sin, because of our freedom, the choices we make, mistakes that we make, others' mistakes, the bacteria, as you hear people talk about how many how thousands of kinds of bacteria there are and viruses that are a result of the world we live in. I don't think they were in the Garden of Eden. The diseases that we have, the genetics, believe me, I understand what gene genetics is all about. It's, uh, it's not pleasant. And uh, my mom always said that when I was bad, I took after my dad's side of the family. And my, my dad always said when I was good, which was not very often, I guess, I took after my mom's side of the family. But you've heard that. that your parents probably said that to you as well. I think our diet has a lot to do to it, as well as, as what was mentioned in, in um, the book God Forsaken, natural laws. The natural laws that we face in this earth are something that is a part of our Society is a part of our life, is a part of the world, and, and the storms, the, the you know gravity, uh, the way things work. Um, it's part of the problem with the way we are. Tragedies, tsunamis, earthquakes. Could obedience to God's law eliminate some of these problems? Sure, a lot of them. You've eliminated a lot of problems in your lives because of the change that you have made. And what, what message is it that we are trying to present to the world? What did God expect Israel, the prophets, the church, and those whom he have called, what has he expected us to present to the world? A call to repentance. To tell the world that they need to repent and change. Because we could have a whole lot better life if we would turn to God. Now, we're not going to remove all of the risks because what was it that was told to Adam and Eve back in the Garden of Eden? And we're all a part of it. The soul that sins, it shall die. Doesn't say when. 
doesn't say whether you're a poor two-year-old child or a 104-year-old man that died here recently in Tyler. It varies from person to person. There are no guarantees in life. Now, does God intervene and can God heal? You bet. Are there examples in Scripture? Of course, a lot of them. But we're going to see some things along the way that I think will help explain that as you try to explain that to other people. What happened, I think a lot of people forget this, what happened in Genesis chapter 6? Didn't God intervene and destroy the earth, all of mankind except Noah and his family because of the flood? People wonder sometimes with God's silence over the years why God doesn't do something. Well, God did do something. You know, in a very short time period after creation, he destroyed everybody because of sin, because man's way was continually bent on being evil and going against God's way. That, that's hard to, hard to understand sometimes. Even though you read it in Scripture and you know this took place, and there are those that tell you it didn't take place, but it did. But to destroy the whole world because it was so bad, how much worse was it than what we are today? And we don't live in an absolutely horrible environment or society here in Tyler. It's, it's a fairly good community compared to some communities. But how bad must the world have been for God to have to destroy everything? It must have been pretty bad. And as we're going to see, he purged the earth by water the first time, and there is going to be a second time when he purges it, but it's going to be with fire. That is yet to come, and that's what people don't understand. And that's why our call is important in calling us and being a light to the world and helping them to come to see that people need to repent and change before it's too late. Second Peter chapter 3. This kind of sums up a lot of this in the first part of Second Peter chapter 3. Paul says in verse 1, I stir up your minds by the way of remembrance that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of the apostles, the Lord our Savior. Knowing this, first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, saying, where is the promise of his coming? In other words, where is God? Why hasn't he done something? For since the fathers fall, fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. But this they are willingly ignorant, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Oh, it happened. It took place. God's word said it does. But there are still people who are going to question, where is God, and why hasn't this happened and taken place. Time goes on. Things continue. Things get bad. Troubled times. Life is, is a risk. We live in a physical world and yet we're told to believe in God and trust in Him and live a certain way of life. What more could God do? I mean, when you stop and think about it, what could He do? He destroyed the earth by water, started over again. He called the nation of Israel as an example. He sent all the prophets to give a message. And then he sent his son, whom was killed. He sent the apostles, built his church, called people out of the world as a witness, performed miracle after miracle down through history. But for the last... 2,000 years has basically <coughs> remained silent. Can you blame God? What else could God do? I mean, he sent his son, they killed him in spite of the life he lived and the miracles he performed. But Jesus came and he healed a few people. He performed a few miracles, but he didn't heal everybody. And as we're going to see, you know, Jesus took upon himself this human life, which in itself was a a thought to try to comprehend coming down from heaven as God, as creator, as immortal, <coughs> taking on the human form 
it was probably a shock to his system to know what it felt like. But he was willing to do that. What, what more can God do to convince people? But yet that goes back to the word freedom. God has given us the freedom, just like he told Israel in the book of Deuteronomy. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. Choose life that both you and your seed may live. Because he gave us two different ways to live, to offset some of these problems on earth while we live this physical life. Because we have to understand and help people to understand that there's a whole lot more than just this physical life. Heaven is not what they think it's going to be. It's something a little bit different. But this is what we all took on and encountered. We didn't have much choice in the matter. You and I are here because of our parents. We didn't have a say-so in whether we're here or not. But we're here. And so we have to make the most of it. And God gave us the way to make the most of it because he said that we are still all going to die. We're physical. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. This is the one chapter one, in one book that I always try to help people to understand and to point it out to them. They may not like to hear it, but this is just the way it is. And like I said, I have here in my Bible that where it says, there is no guarantee with life. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Verse 2, all things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous and to the wicked. To the good, to the clean, to the unclean, to him that sacrifices and him that sacrifices not. As is the good, so is the sinner. We're all going to die. We're going to have to face that regardless. And even Christ, in all of his righteousness and sinless life, died. So are we any better, and should we expect any more than what our Savior went through? Verse 11, I returned and saw under the sun, this is the key, that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, but time and chance happens to them all. For man also knows not his time, as the fish that are, in an, take, in an, are taken in an evil net, and as the birds that are caught in the snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falls suddenly upon them. This is what we need to understand about life, and I try to explain this to other people. Whether you're Christian or not, we are in this boat. We have to face it. It's time and chance. If you're involved in risky things, you're probably going to be at risk a lot more. You know, my sister-in-law was telling me she'd had an opportunity to climb the Grand Teton Mountain in a few weeks, and she was thinking very seriously about whether she wanted to or not. And I said, don't ask me. I like my feet on solid ground. I, said, I don't mind taking the risk, but that's just not something I want to get involved with. If you drive fast, if you break laws that are physical, you're going to pay the penalty. And people have done that. There's nothing that we can do about it. We can try to be careful. But when you're trying to deal in a, in a world where people don't live by the rules and by laws and by doing things sensibly, you're at risk because of their mistakes. Especially if you're driving down the road and somebody runs into you, you might be following every law there is and, and running the proper speed, but you can't always account for somebody who T-bones you. That's just the way life is. And does God protect us? Oh, yeah. I can tell you times and things that have happened to me over the years where I'm, I'm positive God helped and spared me. There are times and things that have happened to me over the last six years with our, in our family, tragic things. I don't blame God for it, not one bit, because I know that's, that's just a part of life. It's unfortunate things that happen. And as we're going to see towards the end of the sermon, some of the things that Jesus said, about some of those very things. As far as events that happen in society and in the world, and I mentioned before, there are people who are bent on doing things wrong and being evil. And that's just a fact of life. It really is. Psalm chapter 58. There's a scripture that we could spend a lot of time on, a lot of debate. But I think it helps us to understand that, you know, there are people like that. 
there are people who do not want any part of law-abiding citizens. They want to do things on their own, and they don't care at what expense or what your expense is. Psalm 58, verse 3, says, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf adder that stops her ears, which will not hearken to the voice of the charmer, charming ever so wisely. The Hebrew word here means the word estranged, to turn aside, to be strange, to be foreign, to go astray. It's an adjective signifying something outside the law of God. It is a person outside the family. And evil, I think you have to understand, does not necessarily mean evil in every case like we think of it. But think back in the New Testament. What person was it that kind of left the family and went his own way? What son was it that did his own thing and got in trouble? But in the end, kind of came back. Prodigal son. He was one who left the family. He turned aside from the way, rejected what his family had taught him. I've known people over the years, one very specifically, a relative who, from the time he was six months old, was a problem. I mean a problem, a serious problem. He wasn't evil but there was no way that this young man was ever going to do what he needed to do. And his whole life was one of trouble. Now, he wasn't evil in the sense of committing murder like we think of evil or, or trying to destroy people. I'm talking about one who went aside, who did his own thing from the very beginning. Now, the rod of correction did not change that. It did not correct it. His mind was bent on his own way, and he spent extended vacations at different places, as Charles was talking about, <laughs> didn't learn his lesson, didn't seem to have any impact on his life. Uh, he's no longer with me, no longer here. But it's someone I remember from the very beginning, and he, he was just one of those people who was bent on living his own life and nobody was going to tell him what to do. Now there's hope, there's the future, but there are people like that. And you've known that. You've met people like that. We could, we could share stories of people who, you know, you have to ask yourself the question, why? Because they're not like anybody else in the family. They, it doesn't even make any sense. Was it genetics? Possibly. I don't know. I don't know. When people use the same principles to train children and bring them along and everything is done identical and yet you have this, should I say, lifestyle that's totally different and wrong and bent on going another direction, it just happens. And you can't blame anyone in particular. But we could talk about this scripture a lot. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. Life is tough. Well, God, God chose Israel back in the book of Deuteronomy. We're not going to turn there. But if you recall, God chose Israel. God brought them along as his particular people. There are a lot of people that would not want to hear that. But God did do that. God chose them. They're still his select people. He's going, to, he's going to reunite with them later on. But Israel was chosen, and God did it, and God chose to do it because he is God. And, he, and Israel was going to be what to the world? An example. An example of God's law, of God's way of life, and they were going to be something very special. Charles mentioned peculiar people. Well, if you go back into Deuteronomy, you'll read that about Israel. His peculiar people, his chosen people. They weren't called because they were something great, because they were a, a special people other than the fact that God chose them. They didn't have anything to offer. But God chose them because it says of the covenant he made with Abraham. And God told them, a lot of people have a problem with this, if, but if you remember, God told them to do what with the surrounding nations as they were going in to possess the promised land? What did he tell them to do? 
eliminate them, to get rid of them. And he said, don't have any pity on them. A lot of people have trouble with that. They, they don't understand why, but, but if you read a few chapters later, this is from Deuteronomy 7 to, and, verse, and chapter 8 and verse 9. Let me go back. Deuteronomy 7, 8, and 9. But you read towards the conclusion of it in Deuteronomy 9 that God told them that their wickedness was so great that that's why they were being removed and eliminated. There are a lot of people, like I said, who have trouble understanding why God did that. They look at God as being the cruel God of the Old Testament, the unfair God, the God who wiped out nations. And yet, God did it for a reason. Because what took place in the Old Testament is going to follow through at the end time, eventually, to the New Testament. A different way, different time, and a different place, but it's going to happen. Because you see, God is God, and, and he's got a way of doing things. He's got a plan in mind. But because of this thing called man's freedom, he's given us a whole lot of time to do as we please and to mess up his creation and to mess up his way. Over in 1 Samuel 8 and verse 7, I want to read a very pivotal scripture to you that not only deals with Israel but deals with all of mankind and actually goes back and the same thing happened that happened back in the beginning at creation. 1 Samuel 8 and verse 7, The Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. You know, the same thing that took place back in the book of Genesis. Adam and Eve basically told God, we're going to do it our way. This is what we want. And so they did it, and you and I are a result of what they did. And we are still paying the price. The oppressive requirements and the consequences that were going to take place with the king, we are still a part of that today. And in the midst of a political you know, campaigns that, that take place, we, sure, we certainly understand what God was going to tell the people that they were going to inherit or to uh, wind up with if they had a king. And uh, we're still going through that. And uh, yet that's what they wanted because they had rejected God. Over in Isaiah chapter 5, like I said, there are so many places we could go to try to figure out and understand God's plan and what he's doing. You know, God worked with Israel as, as an example specifically for the world to, to be an example to the world. And his people, of all, of all the people on the face of the earth, you think would have, would have gotten the message and would have understood where they were headed. But again, when you talk of freedom, it's the freedom to accept or the freedom to reject. Why is it that some of those kings of Israel and Judah, why is it that most of them were horrible in keeping God's law? We, we didn't have very many Josiahs that came along and tried to reinstitute God's law and tried to get the people in line with God's way. They were bent on going their own way because God doesn't force anybody. He doesn't force you. He doesn't force me. And we can go whichever way we want. But God warns us along the way. He says, once you have been called and chosen, don't turn your back and leave because there is a tipping point where it's too late. And a lot of times I think we have trouble understanding God because we, we are people who are bound by time and we think, a certain period of time has gone by, it's time for things to change. God is not bound by time like we are. God doesn't look at time the way that we do. God will deal with things in, in time, in his time, and in his place at his decision, not ours. Now, I would love to see, as Paul said, prophecies to fail and God, you know, do something different and just intervene and say enough is enough. He could do that. He probably won't because it goes back to that freedom. He's going to give man the entire 
history of mankind, however long that is, to be free and to decide. And then when you get down to Matthew 24, what do you find? Unless there would, was intervention, all flesh would be destroyed. At that last instant, that's when God is going to make a decision, whenever that is. Because he's given man that free choice to decide how he wants to do things. And at, at that point, there will be no going back. Man will not be able to look back and say, well, if you'd have given us another 10 years, we could have figured this out and done it. No, nope. not from what it says in Matthew. God will intervene for the elect's sake, for your sake and for my sake. That doesn't sound very encouraging when you read Matthew 24, but he's going to do that. Because you see, there's something far greater be out, beyond out there. It's called salvation. Because it's called God's kingdom which is going to take place and is going to happen. It's a tremendous message of hope for people. Now, when you're going through horrible problems and you're physically in pain, you can't move, it doesn't sound very encouraging, does it? Hope. It's way out there. You need relief now. Well, sometimes God intervenes and sometimes God doesn't, but that hope is wonderful because we know that there's something far greater than this physical life on this physical planet that there are going to be a lot of things change God says in Isaiah 5 what could have been done more verse 4 to the to my vineyard that I have not done in it he's talking about Israel but if you think about the world what more could God do to it for us for mankind like I said he took and has given us everything and has given us his written word after the death of his son and the death of the apostles. All we have to do is read it and to believe it, to have faith in it. Faith is a very difficult concept for some people. If you can't see it, if you can't touch it, it's not there. But that's what the Christian life is all about. He says in verse 5, I tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge shall be eaten up, break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. I will lay it waste. Now, I wonder sometimes how long God has held things back from this world, from reaching that end point. Because down through history, he has intervened at times, and he will intervene at times to, to direct things. You know, will there come a point where God says enough is enough, and there will be a time where God says there will be a famine from hearing the word, and there will be no more calling out to God that he will not hear. He told Israel that, sent him into captivity. But I think as, as we read God's word and, and understand his scriptures, I think we see that he is, he is still waiting for people to turn to him. And hopefully some of the people that you have contact with and that I have contact with will pick a life of repentance and turn and change and try to make their lives a little bit better. Because we can do that in spite of where we live in this physical world. He says in verse 20, Woe to them that call evil good and good evil. And boy, do we live in those times today. Daniel chapter 4. People not only take pleasure in them, but they want to promote them and try to enforce them upon you, calling good evil and evil good. Daniel chapter 4 couple verses out of here that a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar had to learn the hard way. If you go back and study at all the history of Babylon, you will find that there was a period in the history of Babylon, in history books or whatever, a period of seven years where nothing took place. Now that doesn't prove God's word because they won't admit <coughs> that. But that's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. He became as an animal. Verse 32, They shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you to eat grass and oxen, <coughs> eat, eat grass as oxen. Seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will. The first great world power and his attitude was obviously a wrong attitude, and yet God singled him out, showed this to him as an example to the world. 
Now, we only read about it in history books that there was a void of seven years in their history where nothing happened and nothing took place. That's the seven years we're reading about here. But I guarantee you the people throughout the world understood and knew what had happened and were probably quite fearful of it. Verse 34, at the end of the days, Nebuchadnezzar lifted up his eyes to heaven, his understanding returned, and I blessed the Most High. Well, no kidding, I would too, after seven years of living like an animal. And I praise and honored him that lives forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth, and keep this verse in mind, are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, why do you do this? Isn't that the same thing people are asking today? Why has not God done something? Now Nebuchadnezzar understood it for a while and went back to his old way. But that's what God is trying to tell mankind today through you and through me and through his word and through his son who came and lived and died. That's what he's trying to tell us. Romans chapter 1. A couple verses there. You know, there have also been people down through the ages where God has selected them for specific purposes which is really hard to believe I mean God God did do that and um, you know there was a man in Isaiah you read about called King Cyrus who was of the Medes and Persians who was the, the nation that followed Babylon and God selected him and told him he selected him because he was going to be the one to allow the people to go back the Jews to go back in captivity and rebuild the temple and then there's Jeremiah first chapter of Jeremiah where God had selected him and knew him before he was born and appointed him as a prophet amazing it says a lot about abortion I mean, how many more down through the ages has God known before they were born and didn't write about it in his Bible he could do that doesn't need to tell us everything I don't know but uh, when you read about Jeremiah and God calling him before he was born, you think about abortion, you think, what have we done as people? How foolish can we be? But then that's a, another whole subject in itself. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God says through Paul, we don't have any excuses. What is there is visible, and we can't explain it away. We can reject it. We have the freedom to do that, and we can turn our backs. But God says we are without excuse. And when they became, when they knew God, that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain. We became foolish. We became fools and we glorified the four-footed beasts. And that's where we get idolatry and mythology from. God gave them, he says in verse 28, over to a reprobate mind, which is a mind void of wisdom and judgment and understanding. We chose to go that way. And we re have reaped what we've sown. Romans chapter 9. When I was in the third grade, I'm not going to talk about myself too much because I don't like to do that, but for some reason, when I was in the third grade, there's something that stuck with me all my life. I don't know why it was so important, but it was. But in the third grade, at the beginning of the school year, they would give us a little stick of what looked like butter, but it was clay. We would take that clay, and we had more fun the first 15 minutes of class making cars and tractors and animals and whatever. But when the second semester started, they gave us another stick of clay, so you had a bigger lump of clay. And we did all sorts of things. I, I remember that to this day, and I can remember taking those things and sticking it in my desk and making sure nobody smashed it, you know, when, when we weren't there, because we were proud of the things that we constructed and made. We'd make something and leave it that way for a couple of weeks, and then we'd tear it all up and start over and, and do something different with it. 
Paul describes that in Romans chapter 9 about God and working with clay, working with us. And we have to understand this to understand life. He says in Romans chapter 9, verse 14, What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. This is talking about Israel and the Gentiles and God's selecting of them. But it is the same thing in life with us. God can have mercy on some of you and not on some other people. Totally his decision. God can heal somebody who believes in him and who's a Christian, and God can also heal somebody who doesn't even believe in God. As an example, could he not? But we have trouble understanding that. So then is it not of him that wills, nor of him that runs, but of God that shows mercy? For the scripture said unto Pharaoh, Pharaoh was just a, a person at the time I guess he was at the wrong time in the wrong place because he had a horrible situation when he dealt with God. And he didn't win. But he was just the one that was there at the time. Even for this same purpose have I raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. He was used as an example. I don't imagine Pharaoh feels too good about that now. But that's what God did. Therefore, has he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he wills he hardens. You will say unto me, Why do you yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? No, but, O man, who are you that replies against God? Shall the thing form say to him that formed it, Why have you made me so? Has not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? We're just a lump of clay, and God can do whatever he decides to do. God is not bound to show mercy on any of us, but he does. He's merciful at times. <clears throat> he's called you, and he's called me. Do we have anything specific to offer? No. We're just like Adam and Eve. We're sinners, and the soul that sins, it shall die. We have no guarantees in life. Over in Romans chapter 8, we have a finely tuned universe. We have a, an understanding of life, of who God is, what he's done, what he has shown us. And we just have to keep this in mind and remember <coughs> of what life is. Not only is mankind, some of mankind, groaning for the way things are, but the creation is groaning, as Paul said in Romans 8, verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the creature was made subject to vanity, verse 20, not willingly, but by reason of, whom, of him whom, who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself shall also be delivered from the bondage of corruption. Boy, do we ever wait for that. We wait for that deliverance from corruption. For we know, verse 22, that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. And not only it, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption of the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope. Hope that is seen is not hope for what a man sees. Why does he yet hope for? But if we hope for that which we see not, then we do with we have a hard time with patience, don't we? And my wife would be the first one to tell you about me. You know, we want things now. We want things to happen and take place and be solved immediately. But we don't have the patience to do it sometimes. The book of Isaiah talks about a moral collapse among God's people. How bad society can be and how, how it can become. Where even the good man will find himself at risk. We are living in those times where those that try to do good are looked upon as being at risk. But yet God has done so much down through history. We just have to kind of remember and put all these things together in perspective as to what God is actually doing on this planet. Because he has not written us off. What was it that the book of 2 Peter said? I didn't read it because it was a little bit further down when we turned to 2 Peter. 
He said, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what the, the most important thing is to God, is to give people a chance to repent. And until they do, that door is still going to be open for people to repent. Luke chapter 13, very quickly. Jesus gave several examples of this through his ministry. He said, in verse 1, there were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. The Galileans were kind of rebellious. They got into trouble. Pilate killed some of them. Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose you that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. He says, I tell you no, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. What happened to them, he said, was not because they were any greater sinners than you, part of life or those 18 upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them thank you that you were that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem he says I tell you no but except you repent you shall all likewise perish who built the tower of Siloam was it a construction problem had it been damaged by an earthquake and it just so happened that it fell and killed some people Jesus said it wasn't because they were sinners he tried to point that out we need to keep that in mind. Accidents do happen. And, to go back to what was said in Genesis, the soul that sins, it shall die. Tragedy and accidents are not because of one person's sin or one people's sins or because they haven't been called of God. It has nothing to do with that. It's time and chance in the world that we live in. And there are so many chances that we take in this world that we live in, whether it be natural laws, the breaking of natural laws, genetics, heredity, <laughs> mistakes, sins, we pay the price. In conclusion, over in Psalm chapter 50, <coughs> Psalm chapter 50 and verse 21, God says, these things have you done and I kept silent. You thought that I was altogether such as one as yourself, but I will reprove you and set them in order before your eyes. Consider this, you that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. God is going to act. God is going to intervene. We need to be able to explain to people what is taking place. And I think we can do that as a light because of what we understand. Where is God? He is here. We understand him through Jesus Christ. He became one of us from a, mean, from a meaningless town in Nazareth. He entered this world to see what it felt like. His own family questioned his sanity. He struggled with fear, with pain, with helplessness, with hope, the same frontiers that you and I struggle with. He loved, he was lied to, betrayed, taken prisoner, beaten, rejected, humiliated, condemned, crucified. He was tempted and suffered and hung there helpless and alone and asked the same questions that so many of us and so many of people that you know ask, my God, why have you forsaken me? So you see, he was tempted. In a, I never thought of that in that way. I, I, I read that statement for years, and I never thought of it as being in the same way of tempting as people who wonder where God is at that time. But he was tempted just like you and me and so many others but he never lost faith in God. This is how we can know God and see what he is doing. I want to conclude with one paragraph from the end of this book, Where is God When It Hurts? Because it puts in perspective what we have talked about here today in a paragraph form that I think is, could, could not be done and written in a better way. Philip Yancey did a wonderful job with it. Where is God when it hurts? He has been there from the beginning, designing a pain system that even in the midst of a fallen world still bears the stamp of his genius and equips us for life on this planet. 
He transforms pain, using it to teach and strengthen us, if we allow it to turn us toward him. With great restraint, he watches this rebellious planet live on in mercy, allowing the human project to continue in its self-guided way. He lets us cry out like Job in loud fits of anger against him, blaming him for a world that we spoiled. He allies himself with the poor and suffering, founding a kingdom tilted in their favor. He stoops to conquer. He promises supernatural help to nourish the spirit even if our physical suffering goes unrelieved. He has joined us. He has hurt and bled and cried and suffered. He has dignified for all times those who suffer by sharing their pain. He is with us now ministering to us through his spirit and through the members of his body who are commissioned to bear us up and relieve our suffering for the sake of the head. He is waiting, gathering the armies of good. One day he will unleash them and the world will see one last terrifying moment of suffering before the full victory is ushered in. God will create for us a new, incredible world, and there will be pain no more. <laughs>